episode title. Are we running? Yes. All right. <clears throat> hi there, everyone. My name is Scott Nicholson. And hi there, everyone who's watching on Twitch TV. Welcome. Um, so I'm at Syracuse University, where I'm a professor there. And I run a lab called Because Play Matters. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, meaningful gamification scenario I've been exploring. Really, it was one of the things that was triggered by my time here. Because I was here in the 2011-2012 academic year. Uh, I was a visiting professor here in the Comparative Media Studies. I worked with uh, the Gambit Game Lab as a visiting scholar. That's where I spent most of my time. And I actually was a resident scholar in Simmons Hall. So I lived, uh, I lived there with the undergrads, which all of these were very transformative experiences for me. And it's been interesting to spend time reflecting upon what I picked up and how I changed. Um, one of the things that really uh, inspired a whole line of things was helping out with an event that we ran at the MIT Museum where we did different forms of game design. And I ran a family game jam for where families came in and they made games. Um, I've actually since taken that and really run with it and made this lab that I've got running back at Syracuse called Because Play Matters. And it's designed on, we're, we're creating transformative games and play for informal learning environments. So we've done actually a lot of game jams like the one that I did here. I've done that at other art museums. We did one all out of Play-Doh. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff on helping families and kids to make games quickly and working with science museums and making game jams for non-game design people and helping them explore creativity through game design and turning them into game designers. The other thing that I made, and this actually was inspired by MIT, is the Game Designers Guild. This is a group that's inspired by the student groups here because what I noted is the student groups here were so rich in that you had not only students, but you had faculty, you had staff, you had alumni, and you had people in the community coming to these groups. So I created this Game Designers Guild, and we meet once a month on a Friday night on the SU campus, but it's open to anyone that wants to show up. And we're getting kids, we're getting families, and what we do is each, each month we invite someone from the public who has the need to have a game made. We make a prototype with them, and then either try to write a grant to fund it or actually make and run the game. So this led to, for example, this summer we ran a live-action role-playing game for a public library for kindergartners where they all got to be dinosaurs. And they all went, and it started with the library coming to us and saying, we want to make Dinosaur Candyland. And so they had this vision of a Candyland board, and kids would draw cards. And I said, let us come up with something more interesting. <laughs> so what we ended up doing is the kids came in. We told them we had, we had to send them back in time. There was a real problem with a mama dinosaur. The time tunnel was broken, and we could only send little people through. We couldn't mm -hmm. actually send a big person through. So we'd help them, but they were on their own. They had to find and do research with dinosaur books to find out what kind of dinosaur they wanted to be. So they would tell us, we would do face painting on them to make them look like that dinosaur. They got to pick one special ability. Do you roar? Do you fly? Do you have a claw? Do you have a tail? And then they, we'd put them in teams. They'd go through the tunnel. And they'd go through a series of challenges then where they'd have to work together using their skills to save the eggs and find food and rescue the dinosaur. Then they all got to have punch and pie together in the dinosaur uh, playgrounds at the end. And so it was, it was really cool, though, you know, seeing that that came out of this community group. And we had people from the Syracuse community. So what we're doing now is we're actually making games for good for the community. I'm now writing this up into, I don't know, franchise is not the right term, but trying to create the Game Designers Guild Hall for any group that wants to start a Game Designers Guild to help empower local game designers to come together and make games for good for their community. Some of this has come out of the fact that there isn't a games program at Syracuse. So I wanted to have people to work with. So I needed to create a structure that would actually get the community involved. Um, the thing that was really interesting was the, that we had, so what we do is we meet, we, we develop prototypes, and then there's an open time for anyone with a game they're looking for feedback on to present it. So at one of the meetings, this, this girl stands up and she says, I'm so-and-so, and I'm six, and I made this game about saving the princess. Who will play it with me? And we had a group of gamers, you know, over there helping her work through this princess saving game. And I was like, that's, that's really neat. So this is, says, this is stuff was inspired by the time I, I was spent here. That's actually, it's, it's been cool to see the environment here and take some of that back with me. But today, what I'm going to talk about is gamification. We're going to talk a little bit about what is a gamification. We're going to talk about reward-based gamification, meaningful gamification, then a little bit about my experiments of gamification in the classroom. So definitions of gamification, I'll present a few of them. I'm actually working on my own right now as I'm developing a book. This is the one that I used for some time, the use of game design elements in non-game contexts. Uh, Sebastian Dietring and others pre presented this one, but this, they're, even, they're even questioning, do we even need the word elements in this definition? Can we just focus on game design? And one of the problems I had with that definition is that it didn't help people understand the difference between game-based learning and gamification. 
there's a lot of confusion between these things. So something like where in the world is Carmen San Diego? That's that's game-based learning. That's this this world. But as you're playing it, you're not actually moving around a, a space looking for a fugitive named Carmen San Diego. There's no impact that's going on out there in the real world. You're playing this game and you're learning from this game. Uh, some fact, some uh, professors and some <coughs> teachers use civilization as a way of teaching history and things like that. And again, that's game-based learning. But the big difference, so game-based learning is where it's, you have this standalone activity and it informs about something through perhaps simulation, through puzzles and things like that. But it's, it, it's typically used to teach content. Gamification is the game-based layer that's trying to motivate people to do stuff. So if you want to think about it in a classroom setting, the gamification would be the syllabus. That's the game-based layer that's motivating people to do things. You would use game-based learning to help them learn the content. That's the, the sort of the best way I've found to split the two, whether you're thinking of a layer that's getting people to do something in the real world and actually make changes. So I've been looking for other definitions that might help me to make that clarification. Um, so Seth, uh, Seth uh, Prebotch talked about building the game layer on top of the world. This, and he actually runs, uh, he did a TED talk, but he also runs Bunchball. But this concept of a layer is something, in fact, I've taught a gamification course now twice, and each time I've taught it, and I'm teaching it a third time, I'm changing the title to try and make it fit better. First time was gamification, the second time was adding game layers to the world. But now actually where it's moving is the new name of the course is going to be called Motivating Through Games and Play. Because what I've realized is that at a core, gamification is about motivation. And that's really where I'm tying things into. Um, so we've started to see some folks bring in the term playful and tying that in with gameful, and I like that definition. Um, Gabe Zickerman, who we'll talk about him in a little bit, talks about this idea of it's trying to get people engaged, getting them to engage with the world. So I'm, I'm, this is sort of my definition in progress. I'm still working this through. Um, but something with gameful and playful, that's important. Is it just someone using something gameful, or are they actually creating it? Still struggling with that one. But it's important to think of it as a layer on top of another system. That's really what we're looking at. And at the core, what you're trying to do is increase motivation with that, with that other system. So the idea, the sort of definition I'm playing with right now is that gamification is the use of a gameful or playful layer to motivate involvement in the system. Because really at the heart of this is this motivation concept. That's what I've realized this is all about. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. But I want to talk briefly, very briefly, given the context of where I am, um, about what is a game. People always ask, well, what is a game anyway? This is a simple definition of game, but it's one that I like to use. Um, the game is a form of play with goals and structure. It's a very open definition. I find it's useful to have an open definition um, as compared to constraining this concept down. And we'll come back to this in a little bit. Because a lot of gamification is really just about adding goals. It's about finding something in the real world and adding some goals, adding some structure to it. Um, there's, uh, Bernard Suits talks about that a game is actually taking on an unnecessary obstacles. We play games because we want to have little wins in life. Because most of the time life is not about winning. You know, you try things in life and you fail or you've got to work harder on them. And a lot of us play social games because it's a chance to have those little wins. A chance to play something and feel good about ourselves. So a lot of gamification is based on this concept of adding rewards. Adding some sort of layer of rewards to get people to do something. So, the basic structure of reward-based gamification is where you take something in the real world, you add a game-like goal, you develop a structure around the goal, and then you add a reward. That's the basic idea. We've had this sort of stuff for a long time. You've probably seen cards like this. We've had uh, travel loyalty plans, uh, casino loyalty plans, hotel loyalty plans. Uh, there was this thing called S&H green, green Stamps. I don't know if anyone remembers Green Stamps. You know, that was actually well before any of this, which would give you, you'd go to a store, you'd buy something, they'd give you stamps, and you could trade in the stamps for rewards. These are basic incentive systems, very, very basic concepts, but this is probably, most of you carry around something that looks like this at all times, because you have gotten so embodied into these basic reward-based systems. And so it's something we've come to accept, and people are used to dealing with it. Uh, you know, McDonald's, actually, their Monopoly promotion is one of their most popular promotions, and it's taking a basic set collection game concept, and adding it to this incentive layer. But we've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time, and so that's one of the lessons I want to get across, is that gamification isn't new. We've been at it for a while, it's just a name of a collection of different things. We've been at it for a long while. We've been using badges as a way to inspire people to do stuff in the real world for a long time. You know, Napoleon actually figured this one out. He said, a soldier will fight long and hard for a bit of colored ribbon. 
So the military has figured out badges are great systems to get people to engage with things. And we've talked about badges in the classroom. You know, let's use badges to get kids to do stuff. But what's interesting is, you know, we already came up with this badging system for the classroom. It's already out there. You know, it's this set of things that we agree upon that have meaning, that take everything you do in the class and boil it down to something, some little badge that then you take as your public display of everything you did in that class. Now they're trying to move beyond just a grade for badges in the class and the ideas you can then break down what someone learns. But what I want to remind people is just because we move a little bit beyond, we say, well, we're using badges now, it's like, well, you know, there's, we've actually screwed up our educational system because of our reliance upon these rewards. Anyone that teaches undergrads knows that the chance of getting them to do something without a reward attached can be very frustrating. And it's because for years, when, when kids, before kids start into a schooling system that has grades and this sort of reward structure, they want to learn a lot. Once they start getting re rewarded for learning, that desire to learn goes down. And I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. So one form and the typical form of reward-based gamification is a term I give, I've called BLAP gamification. BLAP for four letters, badges, levels and leaderboards, achievements, and points. I also call it BLAP because what many people do to gamify something in the real world is they take this pile of, uh, of things and drop it onto a real world context. It lands, it goes BLAP, and that's what they've got is you know, their gamification structure. So the basic way this works, this is your game, if you, you, if you want to become a gamification consultant and go make a lot of money, just know this thing and you can start blapping around. Um, may not be, it may not be the, the, the best thing to do, but you know, it'll get you going. So first, figure out how do you want to manipulate people and give them points for that. Game designers are good at this, by the way. I'm working on a piece right now about game design and using play instead of points to manipulate your players. Because if you think about it, a game designer actually has two tools that they typically use. They give you points and they punish you. Now, it used to be they punished you with lives. You know, you'd play Pac-Man, you'd, you'd get points for doing good stuff, you'd lose lives for doing bad stuff, and the game was about risk versus reward. How do you get people to take risks to get more points uh, and punishing them by making them lose lives? But now today's games have taken out the life structure. Or have they? If you play a game today that doesn't have lives, what happens if you fail at something? What do you have to do? You have to redo it. So you try to do something, you try to do a boss fight, and you have to restart. You have to redo it. You haven't lost a life up here. What you've just lost is your real life. Because you've just given up six minutes of your real life for a chance to redo that fight. And every time you redo that fight, you're giving up more of your real life. So game designers now, instead of having these artificial lives, have added in, oh, by the way, yeah, you can, you can play until you win, but it's going to cost you lives. Your real life. So this is actually what I'm writing about, the sort of creepy space we're in right now with game design and the play it and play and, and if you think about social gaming, it's all about that's the, the lives we're taking from you, your time, your life cycles on this earth to allow you to play and try again. Anyway, creepy motivation aside. So the idea here is that with gamification, you start by giving people points to get them to do something and then to help them understand those points, you can turn them into a level structure, which means as you get more points, you go into different areas of the system. If the gamification system is built this way, it becomes more complex and more interesting as you go up in level. Or you can use leaderboards, which allow you to see how well you're doing compared to other people. You can use both of these as well to see that comparison if it shows you levels boards. But the idea is with a, it's, it's do you want to track players' progress through a system or players' progress against each other, for which L you want to use. Achievements are going to be other paths outside of the basic point structure to let you explore the space. These are actually can be very interesting if they're done well, but sadly most designers aren't doing them well. <laughs> Great, you created, you finished the tutorial, have an achievement. <laughs> All right, thank you, I feel so achieved. Um, and then badges are the public display element of this. Badges can show any of this stuff to others. And that's how this all works together for BLAP. But as I was actually, I was here in Gambit reading the, these books on gamification. The, I was reading this book. Gamification by Design, the O'Reilly textbook, and I hit this sentence, and this sentence was my life-changing sentence. Once you start giving someone a reward, you have to keep her in that reward loop forever. It was just kind of thrown in there, you know, just kind of tossed in there. Oh, by the way, you know, once you start, you can't, and I said, I, I was like, full stop. And, I, I, at the, and so I work with libraries and advise them, and there was some interest in using gamification to get people to use libraries, and I thought, I've got to tell the libraries about this. I've got to tell all you about this. Because <laughs> this is that dirty little secret that 
you, if you want to become a gamification consultant, you don't want people to know. Oh, by the way, yeah, that thing I just put in there, yeah, we're going to have to do that forever. And I wanted to figure out why. What's going on there? And I started to explore the why behind this. And came across two books. Um, and if, if, if I can get you to do one thing out of this talk, it would be to look at this book. Punished by Rewards by Alfie Cohn. This book is about, uh, this book is focused on education and teaching. The next book I'll show you is focused more on business. They're both focused on the same underlying structure, the same models, which I'll talk about. And it's the idea of what happens when you give people rewards. What this book has is study after study after study that shows this same pattern, that when you give someone a reward for some behavior that's got creativity or linked to it, or they have to actually think, they have some intrinsic motivation to do that thing, you give them a reward, they then don't want to do that thing as much. Something simple as we find a bunch of people that like to do puzzles. We take half the people and pay them to do puzzles. We take half the people and we let them do puzzles for fun. We bring them all back again, in to again, and we see what they want to do, and <coughs> one half can, can, is happy to continue doing puzzles. The people that got paid for it are no longer interested in doing puzzles. And we see this, this pattern is repeated again and again, that when you reward a behavior, people then don't want to do that behavior without the reward. Kind of like grades, like we talked about earlier. This is the other book, if you want a more business take, Daniel Pink's Drive. And that's his approach. Um, what, one thing that he draws out of this book that I'll bring up a little bit later is what he found that when, in, when there's any sort of creativity that's needed, if you have a reward for doing it, the performance goes down. There was this problem called the candle problem, which has been studied, where it's a problem where you give people a box of tacks and a candle, and you say, can you put that candle on the wall so I can light it and it won't drip onto the table below? And the solution to it is actually you empty the box of the tax and you use the tax to pin the box up on the wall, put the candle in the box and light it. So it requires some creative thinking to actually solve. What they found is that if they offered people money to, to solve it, they failed much more frequently than if there was no reward for solving it. Because when you add a reward, then the creativity shuts down and you get more focused on just the, the, trying to accomplish that goal. So when you have a routine task, or a task for which there isn't an internal drive, then rewards increase behavior. And so that's his focus here, is understanding what kind of task is it, and what do you reward. So rewards can help increase, be, increase, uh, increase the performance when there's, it's a routine task, it's something you're not interested in doing, but if there's creativity, if there's free thought, if you're wanting people to really push themselves and explore, then the rewards actually decrease the ability that, that they'll do that. So, if someone likes to read, then you give them a reward, and then later on you take away the reward, they won't want to read as much. With libraries, libraries have these things called summer reading programs. They're designed to help kids want to gain and learn a, read, a love of reading. So the kids come in and many of these reading programs are reward-based. Read 100 books, get a pizza party. So the kids read for these rewards, and then libraries look at teenagers and they find the people least likely to come to the library are teenagers. And it's so if, they, if, if these programs had worked to inspire a love of reading, this wouldn't happen. And actually, uh, in this book, he actually calls out these summer reading programs for exactly this, that we see this pattern. That if you use rewards, then it, it uh, undermines that pre-existing interest. So when you think about gamification then, there's a tool called Zamzi. Zamzi is a pedometer that you give to a kid. The idea is the kid does exercise, accumulates points. Zamzi system then allows the parents to buy by, to give money to Zamzi, which then turns into rewards for the kids. So the kids carry the pedometer, they do a lot of exercise, they can then trade in the points they earned for rewards. Which is great until you get into what happens when the reward system is no longer there. What happens when the parent isn't putting money in? Then any intrinsic motivation that the kid had to do exercise is now worse than when they started. And this is my concern with gamification right now, is whenever you're doing something for long-term change, it's a problem. So what I did is I went and looked at that equation that I talked about earlier for games is play plus structure plus goals. And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we, I was a math major, so I can solve equations. <laughs> so I said, well, let's, let's, let's play with this a little bit and let's subtract play from both sides. And so we have structure and goals are games without play. So if you think about what, it, what take a game and take away a play, what do you have? You have the scoring system, you have the rewards. You have something that sounds pretty dreadful. But this is this reward-based gamification, is just using this. And I thought, well, what if we focus on the other side of this equation? What if we actually solve this equation a different way? And we think about the play part of games. And we think about, well, what if we use these concepts of play 
And so I decided to try and build up a form of gamification that focuses around building people's intrinsic motivation to do something by helping them find meaning in what it is they're engaging with. So that was my, my quest for meaning, which actually comes a little bit out of my background as a librarian. So I was a librarian, I teach at Syracuse's Information School, and a lot of what I do there is look at how do you match up a user to something they're going to find meaningful in the library. So some of, these, some of this thinking comes out of that space. If you like theory, I've got theory. Um, I don't have the time to wander through the whole theoretical framework, but I'll point you to, if you want to follow up and follow the theory, because playmatters.com is a publications link and it's got this whole theoretical, written, written up, theoretical framework written up. But the really important one I'll point you to, the key of this is self-determination theory, which is the idea that there's three things. If we have these th three things in life, we're going to feel better about what it is we're doing. If we are competent, if we're feeling like whatever we're doing is making us better, if we have autonomy, if we have choice, if we feel like we're making choices about what we're doing, and if we have relatedness, if we recognize how what we're doing relates to the world around us, if we have those three things, we're going to have a positive outlook about what we're doing. And so a lot of what I'm now going to talk about is how do we build gamification that works on building these things, rather than just manipulating people through rewards. But there's, uh, if, if you want to follow up through all of this, I'll suggest you to go to the, uh, go to the website and you can enjoy all the theory you want. But I want to get across that this meaningful gamification concept really matters when you're talking about long-term changing. If a company just wants to sell more gizmos in the next quarter, well then they can incent that through a reward because they're not trying to do a long-term change. If the company, on the other hand, <coughs> is trying to build loyalty, then they need to be aware to just use rewards because if they use a reward system, like I'm a frequent flyer on one airline, but if that reward system ever went away, I don't really have a desire to go back to that airline. I'm doing it because of the rewards. But when you're trying to change someone in the long term, you're trying to do behavioral change, health change, financial decisions change, using reward-based gamification is very dangerous because then if they stop using that gamification system, they're going to be less interested in doing whatever it was you were trying to incentivize. We figure this out in some spaces. So if you've ever been to a science museum or a play museum, or an art museum, these spaces do not require you to get points, levels, and badges to see what's going on. You're wandering in that space because you are want to learn. You have the choice to learn, but they haven't said, museums haven't said, boy, this museum would be great if we had leaderboards of who visited the most stuff. <laughs> and so I started to look at museums and how do participatory museums work. There's another place that figured this out too. In fact, they figured it out so well that people pay a hundred bucks a day to engage with science and world culture. Epcot is, it, there, you don't need points to go to Epcot and to go and explore stuff, but they have created this whole space around getting people to explore in playful and gameful ways facts about what's going on out there. So, so I looked at these models to say, how can we make something that's more playful? How can we make spaces and make gamification that's more about building your intrinsic motivation to do stuff? I looked at this concept of ludic learning spaces, which is this idea of a play-based learning space. This is actually, this is called the Reading Adventure Land. This is from the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. If you're ever through Rochester and you're looking for something to do, this museum is fantastic. They're the ones that do the toy of the year. Um, they, were, they picked the stick a few years ago, you know, as the toy of the year. They really have their head around play. And so rather than, a, than they actually have a branch of the public library embedded in the museum. So that as you're wandering around the museum, there's actually bookshelves, and if you want a book, you can take it and then go check it out and actually take it home. It's a very clever space, but they have the reading adventure land, so they have this space where you're actually engaging in the world of the books and understanding what's going on in this three-dimensional space. So this idea of building a ludic learning space. Um, I started to look at more theories. I'm kind of watching the time here, so I'm not going to spend too much time on theory, but this idea of transformative learning, the concept here is how do we change? Well, first we have to have something that shakes us up a little bit. And games do a good job of shaking us up. A game can help push us out of the mental space we've been in and help us recognize that other people have a different view than we do. The game then can afford you with a space to explore, to plan, to learn, to try new things out and to build your confidence. And this is the cycle, uh, this is Maestro's cycle of how do you help adults do transformative learning. And these stages and is actually what we can build as we're building these systems, try to create this stuff. And what's interesting is this pathway is very, very similar to the stages in play. The stages the kids go through when they play, it's a very similar path. 
So we're calling it, well, adults, they don't play, they do transformative learning, you know. Uh, but transformative learning, that's actually what play is. Play, if, if you play and you are not being transformed in some way, it's boring and you want to do something else. So play is actually, whether it's, it's adults and we like to play because we're engaging in these new experiences, learning stuff about the world, really, that's, they're, they're, they, they layer over each other very nicely. So what I'm going to talk about now is this split of gamification between reward-based gamification, which is focused on using extrinsic motivators to get people to do stuff, and meaningful gamification, which is focused on using intrinsic motivators to get people to engage with stuff. We're going to move into this. Because operationalize it, to make it so people could get their heads around what I'm talking about. Now, an important note, and one of the, uh, there's, the there's a theory, um, a, a organismic integration theory, which says that these two things are actually on a spectrum. It's not a one or the other. And different people will treat things in different ways. So you need to be aware that it's not just always extrinsic motivating for everyone or intrinsically motivating for everyone, but that different people treat this in different ways and that you have the ability to think about this as a spectrum of the sort of motivator you use. So what I created, though, to help people with this is a recipe for meaningful gamification. What I wanted to do is use the letters in the word recipe to give people six things to think about instead of rewards to make gamification more meaningful. Um, and at the heart of this is really some, some game scholars don't like to use the word gamification. They take words like, you know, gameful design or just don't use it. And I said, you know, there's a problem with that. And that is, again, from my library background, there's this concept called control vocabulary. The idea that if you have a word for something and you don't call your ideas that word, people are never going to find your ideas. So if I came up with this other word, well, let's use gameful design for this. Well, anyone that's out there looking for gamification is not going to come across what I'm talking about. So I said, well, let's keep that word gamification and put the word meaningful in front of it. Say meaningful gamification. The other thing that does is it nicely implies meaningless gamification. But so my hope is that as I talk about gamification with this meaningful gamification, I might get a few people who start stumbling across this and say, oh, you mean there's, there's another option. You mean there's something I don't have to do for the rest of my life to actually make a difference, because that's another piece of this I'll talk about in a minute. But I'll go through these six things. So reflection, exposition, choice, information, play, and engagement. And again, this is not new. This is just, actually, if you're a good teacher, you use this stuff. You know, this is really just good ways of engaging people. It's just in this neat little package that I'm attaching it to the word gamification, hoping to draw people to come and see that gamification is not just about uh, slapping a reward system on something. So play. We've talked a little bit about play. I've teased that similarity between what is play and adult transformative learning. Um, that they're basically, they go through the same stages when you play. An important thing that comes out of this, though, is it's optional. This was actually something after I gave a talk about gamification, the director of the Museum of Play came up to me afterwards and said, well, you know, Scott, you need to be careful because if, you, if you're talking about people using play, you need to recognize that play is only play if it's optional. If you, if you require someone to play, it's no longer play. The power of play is that it's an optional activity you can choose to engage with. And that's where I started thinking about those museum-type spaces, creating gamification systems that allow you choice to engage or even not engage with it, and to engage with it in the way that you want to do it. So really making a space, and one of the ways to do is to think about your system as a three-dimensional space. How could you create a space where people could choose to engage in things, rather than just here's the one path to true leveling up, you know, do these things to get these points. So the idea of play, it's this freedom to explore within limits. You put out a few boundaries, you let people play. Some of the fun is bumping up against the boundaries. Some of the fun is actually pushing down those boundaries and going beyond them. That's a very playful thing. You can actually build a system to allow that. Uh, Portal is a great example of a playful game that created artificial boundaries that through the play of the game, the player eventually, oh spoiler, uh, <laughs> the player eventually pushes past the boundaries and gets into this playful space. Um, but the idea of play, we actually see this push towards maker spaces. There's a lot about maker spaces in libraries, maker spaces in communities. One of the reasons why maker spaces are so popular is because they're just a different word for playgrounds. If you think about it, a maker space is just a playground for adults. It's a space where you have a few boundaries, but you really can come in and play and engage. An important part of play that I'll come back to is learning through failure. Play is empowering because you can screw up and you can learn from that. And this is where I get into some concern about all the discussion of game-based assessment. Because I think if you're going to assess someone, 
in a, a, in a formative way, you're going to say, I'm going to test your skills by having you play this game. Well then, the words play this game mean that you should have the ability to play and explore and fail and choose to do things that might not work the best because you want to see what happens. Oh, but by the way, you're being graded on this. Well, then it's not a, it's not a game anymore. It's not play anymore. It's a test that you've just, it's a simulation, you know, that if you want to go that space. But that's another soapbox. Choice. Key part of self-determination theory. Give the participants choices in what they want to engage with. So rather than say, here's the one path of this gamification, say, here are 18 things you can do. Choose what you want or make up your own. I like to try and help the, empower the players to help design these experiences. Give players choices for what they want to pursue. This is actually out of a theory called universal design for learning, which is a theory designed to say when you're teaching someone, you should give your learners different methods of taking in the content and different ways of demonstrating the content. I actually just did this for the first time in one of my classes. I gave the students the chance to, to their final, they could either do a 20 to 30 page paper or a 15 minute video because I wanted to see when they had that choice, what would they take? Um, I only had a couple do the video, but it was interesting that, that the students actually got more engaged because even if they said, well, it's, it's a paper, they had that choice. They could choose which path to, to get their grade. And actually what I've done, I'll talk about what happened in another class where I said, do anything. We'll negotiate it. Tell me what you want to do, but if you want to make a game, if you want to do a video, if you want to you know, write interpretive dance, and we'll talk about what are the structures to help you demonstrate what you've learned through whatever whatever way of doing it. But the idea of choice is you're giving control to players. You're making a system instead of a path. You're trying to say rather than, you know, having these set things you do, you choose. And even if it is, you tell me what your goal is and then I'll give you a suggested path to help you reach it. To say, well, I want to do that. Okay, if you want to do that, here are five badges to help you do that. But you haven't said, here's what you must do. Information. This is something that we miss a lot of the time, and the information concept is providing the players with the why things are being done. Why are they learning? Why are they earning those points? Why are they doing these things? Um, a story about information comes out of Weight Watchers. So I was on Weight Watchers for a while. I lost about 40 pounds, and I've kept it off. And the way I did that is, in Weight Watchers, you get points for food. So you eat that cheeseburger, well, that's 12 points. You have so many points to spend in a day. And that's fine. You can play at that level. You can play at that gamification level. But if you always and only play at that level, and there's never any connection to help you be, make that more meaningful or make that more internalized, then if you no longer use that system, you'll find it's very hard to stay on it. So I hacked it. Sis, I hacked the system. I flipped it around, and I said, okay, how do they calculate this equal 12 points? Because they don't want to tell you that. They want you to continue to pay them $30 a month to be a part of their system and use their wonderful tools. But I said, oh, okay. So you just take this, divide it by 50, add this, take that, divide it by two, that gives you the points. So I could take anything off the store shelves and I could look at these, these base numbers and turn it into the point system. But what that did is that helped me then to be able to internalize, okay, here's the swaps I can make in the real world to understand this is a healthy thing, this is healthier than that, I can exchange these things, and so I got information about the system. It's kind of like hybrid cars. Some hybrid cars give you information about when you're driving, where the fuel is, where the power is going, is the power being stored in the battery, is the power moving around to the engine, am I taking power and am I losing power? And as you drive, you can see that information and figure out how to drive better. As compared to a system that's like, here's a tree, the tree's now greener, Oh, the tree's dying. And so you can't understand the information behind it. So helping to give the players, instead of just the score, provide information. And game-based interfaces are good about this. We're good at giving people information. This is actually also at the core of the difference between playing a tabletop board game and playing a digitized version of the exact same board game. That's one of the things I do, by the way. I study board games. Because when you play that digitized version, the system takes care of so much of the scoring that you forget or don't understand why you're getting points for doing things to the point where the game becomes less meaningful to you because you're pushing things around on the board and just getting points and you don't understand the system. Where this matters is a game where you're doing a learning game, where you're trying to help people understand by the processes that are embedded in the mechanisms. And if you automate too many of those processes out, the players lose that opportunity to learn by manipulating a process. And so that's, that's a concern that you're not giving them enough information to help them understand why they got what they got. 
uh, giving people information allows people to pick what's relevant to them. This is the library thinking. That the, the library space, you provide a space with lots of information, you bring people in and you let them pick what's relevant. So giving them information allows <coughs> them to find what's meaningful, to find what's relevant. And more importantly, it allows people to then continue without the gamification layer because they understand what's going on. Another idea behind this is looking at, oh, if I'm spending a lot of time on information, that's because I'm in a school of information. This is kind of what we do. And this has been my connection back into that school. Say, why should we look at information? Well, we should, why should we look at games and gamification? Well, we look at games and gamification because they are an information conveyance tool. They're a way to convey things that, 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 about what's going on. So like if you're doing physical therapy, you could make a physical therapy gamification system that gives you a badge every time you do 10 of these things. Or you could make a visualization system that actually shows you your muscles, shows you how they're changing over time as you do this exercise, and helping you understand, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, well, that's going to help me then make better decisions about how I do that exercise and if I'm going to continue it, because I understand more of the why. Exposition, or narrative. Exposition, but narrative didn't spell the word recipe. It spelled recipe, so I needed to use something else. <laughs> um, so exposition is this idea of bringing in a narrative. Narr narratives can be very valuable in providing a useful metaphor, but they can also be very misleading and a distraction if they're used poorly. And so you have to be very careful. If you're thinking about a narrative, think about one that helps people understand the real world setting better because of the narrative. Not something that's just an entertainment on the top, but it actually gives the player reasons to want to engage more deeply. Some players will want to engage with the narrative, others won't, and that's where the idea of choice comes into play that you need to give that player the ability to have that narrative or not because it may or may not be meaningful to them. It may be frustrating or maybe a distraction. So that's again giving the players the choice of that narrative. If you want to get really clever, you come up with three or four different narratives, each which conveys information about the real world but in different ways. So you may have a sci-fi narrative, you may have a fantasy narrative, you may have a history narrative. Each narrative layer on the experience still conveys, you design it to still convey information about the real world, but it conveys it in a way that's more meaningful to the, to the person. Exposition can also help transition the player between stages. So it may be that, like Foldit is an example. Foldit is a gamification system that as you get better, you become a very different player. You engage with more of the system. At the start, you're just playing puzzles. Then as you get more into the system, you actually get to make puzzles for other people. And then as you get even more into the system, you are helping scientists solve real research questions by looking by solving these puzzles in different ways. A narrative could help transition the player between those different elements of the game and help them understand what they're getting ready to get into. Engagement. So engagement ties into the self-determination theory, the relatedness concept. How do you help people to engage with each other through your system? The game elements can help people uh, form teams to meet other people, to come in with pre-existing relationships and deepen those. And the nice thing about doing engagement is it helps people to have different perspectives on what they're doing. Uh, to have a critical mass of people doing your thing together helps them all to understand more about it because they're learning about what different people are thinking about it. It's the difference between what I'm telling you here and if I sent you to a paper to read on your own. Because here there's actually going to be a chance to talk some and to engage and, and explore different perspectives of the way different people are engaging with this space. Finally, reflection. Reflection is how things stick. Dewey talked about uh, reflective learning, the idea that if you just do something and you don't reflect upon what you did, then you don't learn from it. If you watch kids at a science museum and actually how they interact with stuff, think about what, what do they actually do? Has anyone watched a kid play at a science museum? What do they do? They, they, they push things and see what happens, how the system reacts. They, they, and they do it relatively quickly, and relatively quickly they move on to something else. <laughs> Because if, if they push something and it doesn't react immediately, they might push it a couple more times and they're done. They're moving on to something else. But there's doing, lots of doing, not always so much reflecting. And so then you can think about, well, how could the parents structure reflection on the drive home or talk about what they went through to have those moments where they think about well, what, what actually went on there. Reflection is actually an important time where you get to build meaning because it's where you're going to be able to connect what you just did to your sense of self. Reflection works great with other people because you're sharing, well, this is what was meaningful to me. Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, here's what's meaningful to me. So it's be reflection is something best done with others. So that's the recipe. And what I'm, I'm suggesting is instead of using rewards, think about ways to use these things to help people engage with something in the real world. Reflection or exposition, choice, information, play or engagement. The idea on all of these is we're trying to build people's 
intrinsic motivation by helping them find touchstones, helping them find points of, that's meaningful to them with the real world connection. So I tried this. This is a book called uh, The Multiplayer Classroom. And this book was actually the idea, uh, Lee Shelton wrote this book, and the, the concept was how do you take ideas from massively multiplayer online games and use them to structure your class? And I said, well, let's see how this works. So it's, it's, and it's more blappy. It's more of taking you know, points and levels and leaderboards and all that. And I said, let's, let's test it out. So you start out by saying this. Good morning. Welcome to the first class of the semester. Everyone in this class is going to receive an F. Hooray. The idea is that you start people with nothing, and everything they do in the class builds up. As they build up to enough points, it then equates to different grades. So, so it's, it, the concept is you're sending the message of, hey, no matter what you do, it's always going to help you. Instead of our normal classroom setting, which is, here's your A, don't <laughs> lose it. You know, where everything you do is, oh, you lost points, oh, down, 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 here's the red pen of death. As I tell my students, the more I bleed on their papers, the, the fewer points that they get. They're basically, you know, as, they, as, I, as I, I cast my red pen of blood on the paper, their points go down and down and down. So, so I tried this in my classes. I started my classes this way. Um, uh, several people dropped. <laughs> that was the first, first reaction. One person wrote a very nasty letter as they dropped about, uh, you know, how dare I come in and, and flunk them all and blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, well, you could have stuck with it. So anyway, I, but I wanted to test this because the book focused on examples for classes related to gaming. And as I read it, I thought, you know, what would happen if you use this in a class that had nothing to do with games? Would it still work? Could you add a game layer to this sort of class? So I tried it in two, so, two different classes. I taught a class on meaningful gamification where I used this. And I taught a class on information reporting and presentation where I used this. So this was a split level online class. I had both undergrads and grads. It was an elective. So it's a game topic, people interested in gaming stuff. This requirement, undergrad, uh, public speaking, so not necessarily any interest in gaming stuff. Class one was only online? Yes. So this was just, uh, this was an asynchronous online class. This is a face-to-face -face class. So I added some of the systems that they talk about in the book. And in both, both classes, I put in a leveling system where you leveled up. Um, in both classes, I gave them choices of assignments. Here's all stuff you can do. Everything you do earns you points. You pick what you want to do. I added a narrative layer to both classes. Um, in this meaningful gamification class, they had an unknown future, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We had a known future in the information presentation one, and then I, had, I tried leaderboards and things like that. So we'll talk about this one first, and we'll see what went wrong. I mean, how great it worked. <laughs> So this was the syllabus that I, I gave out in this class. So this was an online asynchronous class. We never physically met. So I, I formatted it like your, your strategy guides. And so I presented that the, they had the strat they had the sort of syllabus part, which is what they had to do in the strategy guide, which talked through how to do these things. The backstory in this is they were on, going on the quest for Mount Gamification. And as they did things, they, wrote, they got higher and higher uh, in elevation. And as they get higher and higher, they would get a higher grade. That was the sort of narrative story. They all created avatars, and because I was going to use leaderboards in this class, I, but I was concerned about the privacy of the students in the class, so what I did is I showed the ranked leaderboards for the avatars. The players only knew their own identity. They didn't know the identity of other players in the class unless they had told other people personally, but there was no place. The avatar boards were anonymous and set separately from the boards for the actual class. So I knew who was whom on the leaderboard. Students could only see themselves and they could see other class members, but they didn't know who was whom. They just knew where they sat. My master plan for this class, so the first six weeks, I pulled out all the marketing, black gamification type readings. Let's read how fantastic rewards are. And then I gave them a big decision point, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then we moved into talking about meaningful gamification, uh, looked at Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal, sort of shifted from behaviorism to humanism. So sort of the pattern I showed you here was how I structured the class. The thing is I wanted them to buy into reward-based gamification. And so I used every dirty trick I could from here. Every manipulative thing, I tried using uh, reward systems for assignments where they didn't know what the reward was until they did the assignment. <laughs> so that's actually the most, uh, one of the most manipulative ways to do things is like a slot machine, where every time you pull, you may get nothing, you may get a big payout. So I did assignments like that. I said, you can choose to do it. because they, So they had stuff they, they know they get rewards for. They had stuff they didn't know what the reward is for. Sometimes it would get them a, a, an achievement. So one time they got Don, some people won the Evil Overlord achievement. 
because they chose to take on this assignment and I picked the best ones and they got to be evil overlords, so I would address them as evil overlord so-and-so. Um, so that one they liked, but <laughs> sometimes they just did and like, thanks. You know, and so I found that that didn't work too well. I wouldn't advise that kind of annoys students when they turn in an assignment, they don't get anything for it. Um, so it's not quite as motivating as the slot machine model. But the leaderboards provided something interesting. So in this class, I had leaderboards. And so what I'm showing you here is what's going to happen over the first six weeks of class. Each dot represents a different student. So this was week one, and they had a big pile of stuff to do. They couldn't do everything. It was just not enough time to do everything. But everything they did got them points. So some people did stuff. Some people didn't do quite so much stuff during week one. Week two, so again, we see that a few people are doing quite a bit. Uh, we've got some people that have done some things. We've still got a few others that decide, have, have decided they're even buying into this whole gamification thing. So week three, again, we see three people. And leaderboards tend to be, they, they will drive the people at the top. But then what starts to happen, if you notice, you start to see people flatline, which means they've stopped doing anything in the class. Everyone that's a flat line here did nothing for week after week. In fact, if you look, you know, you've got three people that were doing things, you've got a chunk of people that started doing things, but then they saw this gap and they gave up doing things. And I actually talked to students after the six weeks that I did this experiment to say what happened. And what happened is a bunch of people got really demotivated in this class. And in fact, I was getting ready to have most of these students had decided they were dropping the class. That's when I decided we were going to stop this little experiment <laughs> and figure out what to do. So we had one student that just went crazy. We had a couple that were doing well. And then, but if you look, many of the students did little or flatlined, and half the class was barely doing anything. And so the leaderboards were extremely demotivating for almost everyone. The high-performing students were motivated, but the thing is the high-performing students are going to be motivated anyway. So what this did is this actually hurt the people that needed most, the most motivation. So that was my experiment there. Um, so what I did then is it was an online class, and so I sent them this video. Adventures to me quickly. Things have gone very, very wrong in this quest for meaningful gamification, and I'm really afraid of where everything's going to be heading, so I'm here to give you a chance to escape. You've seen a few things already that, that might have concerned you. You might have learned about the points that are being doled out by this instructor of yours, that he's even made some of you into evil overlords. I can't believe where this has gone. But to escape, you have to make a choice, and I'm going to give you that choice now. Before me are two dice, red and blue. I choose the blue die, and I go away. You continue on your quest for meaningful gamification. You wake up in the morning, and you think whatever you want to think. You choose the red die, and the whole thing changes. Everything starts over. I can't tell you what it's going to be like, because you're going to help me make it. So it's your choice. What are you going to do, Alice? You're going to go deeper in the rabbit hole? You're going to wake up tomorrow, with everything being just the way it was. Make your choice now. So they had 24 hours to pick uh, which way they were going to do. And we had one student who wanted to keep it the way it was. Any guess who? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> this person wrote me a very distraught email. She said, I have not slept. She said, I've worked so hard in this class to earn all these points. And it's all going to get wiped out. And I don't feel that's fair. But I feel I want to see what's going to happen. I don't know what to do. These people are like, ah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, so the majority of the class voted to change it. When they came back, there was no class. And said they were in groups and said, you all are now making the class. You are designing the syllabus. Um, and here's the process we're going to follow from that. And so the challenge was now, how do you make a syllabus that's fair? That's fair to these people who worked their butts off for the first third and, and fair to people who sloughed for the, for the first third of the class. How do you make something that's fair? I said, well, figure it out. So they did. What they ended up doing was making this. This was their new narrative, so they could choose to have it when the class voted on what they wanted. So surprise, you weren't playing the game you thought you were. You weren't moving up through Mount Gamification. You were a lab rat the whole time. You've been scurrying through a maze for the last several weeks, and now you're trying to find the way out. So this was the student-created narrative for the class. They were all lab rats in my evil maze. 
So I took on the role of Dr. Evil Nicholson. You know, I, 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 all my videos from that point on, I was wearing a lab coat, I had an assistant, I set up a maze in my basement, put the camera at the bottom of the maze. Because that's the part of it. If you give the students the ability to set up their own world, you have to be willing to go with it, to go with what they say, and to play with it. What ended up happening out of this class, though, the way we dealt with that problem, and the students came up with this. It was a great solution, and I'm still using this model. The students wrote, each one wrote a contract that said, here's the grade I want in this class. Here's what I've done so far, and a reflection on what they've done. Here's what I'm willing to do to earn that grade. And they came up with, the groups came up with a list of about 18 different things they could do. Um, and then I negotiated with each student to ensure that there was some fairness in what, the, what it was they were doing. So they were all about to, but that meant the people who really worked hard earlier, they would only, they might do one big paper to finish out the class. The people who hadn't done anything were doing quite a bit at the end. Out of everyone in the class, one student did not fulfill the contract. Everyone else did everything that they said that they would do to earn the grade they said they wanted to earn. At the end, you know, a lot of people actually talked about how this was a great class, they learned all this stuff, but it was also very difficult. And now I don't use this structure anymore because I did see how hard it was putting st students through this. I wanted them to buy in to the power and the dangers of rewards, but it really went a little too far. It was a painful experience for some of these students. So actually now in future classes, we look at this class, say, well, here's what happened, um, but I'm not putting my students through everything that I did before. So, um, and so the, uh, this was, Kind of what they came up with, a, a big reflection structure. Um, they created rat packs, so they were in packs of students working together. Uh, they, they wanted to create a place to give each other badges, so I suggested we'll call that the rat skeller, which is a, a word for tavern, and then they got to make their escape. The other class, this was the structure that I used for my speaking class. So this was the structure where they had a pile of assignments to do. Assignments were all worth different amounts of points. They had a pile of optional things that they could do. And then it went towards raising their level in the company they were working for from an F level where they were up to an A level. There were some real problems with this. Oh, and they had the ability to redo assignments if they didn't do very well. So first problem, it was very confusing to non-gamers. If I show non-gamers this system, they, many of them struggled with it. It was overwhelming. The uh, second problem that came in too was the athletic department contacts me halfway through and said, hey Scott, what grades do all of your students have? <laughs> well, <laughs> everyone's got an F. <laughs> what? Why? What? Everyone is failing? It's like, well, yeah, everyone still has an F because you have to do 60% of the stuff to, you know, like, well, what is their percentage out of? And it's like, well, there's no out of because it's like, here's a pile of stuff they could choose to do. So that caused issues. Um, it was very hard for students to conceptualize what their current grade was. I did, they were just, they didn't understand, you know, what, what's my grade? So we had a vote at the halfway point and 75% of the people wanted to dump this. So that didn't work out. Oh, before we go on, candy time. <laughs> Everyone take a couple M&Ms. Don't eat them yet. And pass the bag. So the problem that I had is I used the word optional. I learned a really important lesson here. If you call something optional, then students don't do it. Because what happened is that students would say, well, I put off optional stuff in this class to do required stuff in other classes. But the reality was that they didn't do anything optional. The best grade they could get was a C. So I said, do these five things to pass. Do optional things for a B or an A. But when it came to actually doing the optional things, they put them off. And students got really upset with me about that. So I said, well, yeah, I told you it was optional. Um, so... What I learned is I don't use this word anymore for stuff that's, that's worth points in a class. Just don't use the term optional because students think optional, they think it's extra credit or not worth anything. Uh, that, that failed. But what overall my lesson was, I created a net with holes that were too big for the poorer performing students. The students that most needed supports from these systems don't get them. That's too easy for them to fall through the cracks when you set up these optionals, these choices. So I needed to work on stuff that supported these weaker students, and that's what my systems are today. So the things that have stayed from all this experimentation is this idea of making a playful classroom. I allow students to redo assignments. They have the ability to actually present assignments to peers before they show it in class. And I also make the students co-designers. So in the classes, I allow them to help customize their narrative. I still, in my gamification class, I present it as they come to class, I say, well, you know, a syllabus is gamification for the classroom. So the first thing you're going to do is write your gamification. 
and they try it, we vote on one, we stick with it for a little while, we learn some tools, then they redo the syllabus, we vote on it, we stick with it, and so they actually use redesigning their own class as their experimentation space. And that's, this stuff has stuck to help me support those weaker students, and it all comes back to self-determination theory. So, to conclude what I'm talking about, and sort of what I've explored so far, this idea of meaningful gamification, it's about using concepts based in play and self-determination theory to build intrinsic motivation. And to apply that to the classroom, you want to give your students choices or control. It does mean you're going to spend more time grading. If you allow people to redo assignments, you're going to have to grade more. But I see students at the end, after they've tried, failed, and redone something, they're much better than they would have been if they tried, they got their C, they moved, they moved on. So it makes students end up learning a lot more. And you focus more, though, on the process instead of that end reward. So what am I doing next? Well, Actually, before I talk about what I'm doing next, we'll talk about candy time. So, you all just took some peanut M&Ms. Now, I want you to think for a minute about those peanut M&Ms. So, made a choice of what peanut M&Ms to take. Why did you take the ones you took? What was appealing to the ones you ended up taking? In fact, I'd like you to pick one of the ones out right now that you have in front of you. Choose one. This one the one you choose is the one you're going to get to eat first. So, you've all made a choice now. Based upon what? What did you choose that on? It was the biggest one. The biggest one. I think it had more peanut in it. Maybe more peanut, you don't know. Matching color. Color. Match a color, you know, you're saying, you got a green one. You know. Strangely shaped. Strangely shaped. So something about that appealed to you. Now what I want you to do is to put the M&M in your mouth, but don't bite it. Taste the outside. Taste that shiny thing that you picked it out for. What does it taste like? My hand, <laughs> someone else's hand. It tastes like sugar and no nothing, you know? Okay, so now bite into it just a little bit and experience what happens. <laughs> An experience, so, so it, it sort of breaks apart a little bit. So my concept and what I'm talking about and how to, and then, so yeah, so now you're in sort of that chocolatey thing. You may need another try, so you've got some more there to work through. And so really experience that M&M and experience the shell, experience the chocolate, and then experience what stays with you more with that nut. <coughs> so this is my, after you have the recipe, this is my M&M model of what I'm working on now is the gamification journey. This is the book that I'm putting together. And it's the idea of allowing the gamification to escort someone from not being involved in something at all to being involved in a community of practice. That's my goal here. And my goal with this whole journey is that the gamification goes away. Just like in the M&Ms you're eating, all of that sugary stuff actually goes away, leaving behind that peanut that's going to go down to your digestive system, and you'll see it tomorrow. And so, <laughs> so the layers here, first, that crunchy layer is like using rewards. Rewards can be the way to draw people in, but it should break apart and not be important very quickly. The, the idea is you, you build a reward system that is either affiliated just with a tutorial space, that you end up getting so much of the reward that it's meaningless. Um, you use different tricks to create it. If you need to use a reward system at all, use one that is designed to be unimportant quickly because it gets people into the meaningful part, the chocolate. The idea of that is you want to now have ways, so I lured you in with a little bit of reward, but when it breaks apart, and because, you know, when you tasted your shiny reward, it, didn't, it wasn't very appealing, you know, and, and so that's what you want your rewards to be, is actually when you get into them, not very appealing, but as you engage with that reward, you stumbled into some of these meaningful aspects. You stumbled into things that made you say, oh, hey, that's kind of neat, let me explore that. Kind of like Fold It. Starts with shiny puzzle game. Then it's like, oh, hey, this is part of a community. I'm in a little deeper. It uses alternate reality game design concepts where you get people to try and find some way of it's more important to them. But then as I thought about it, I said, you know, I don't want that to be the end goal. I don't want the end goal being these meaningful gamification layers. I want the end goal to being we actually get people engaged in the real world. And the way that happens in the long term is through something called a community of practice. And the idea is you help people find a community in which they can engage with others and you drop away these gamification layers, and you leave them in the community of practice. You leave them in the position of being a mentor, being a teacher, being a creator, or being a participant in a community. Because that community of practice is what can keep people involved in something in the long term. If you think about the, the things you've chosen to be involved with in the long term, many times it's because there's, you've found some engagement, you've found some community. So that's actually the idea of this, this book I'm working on, this peanut M&M model, you know, is, is this idea of 
you have this gamification system designed such that it, it, if you need rewards, you use them only for those things that are non-creative tasks that people don't have intrinsic motivation for. You then move them into more meaningful things to help them make their personal connections through reflection. But the whole point of this is getting them into a community of practice, helping them find places to engage. Board Game Geek is actually a good example of a system that does this. I don't think they thought about doing it, but they've done this quite well. That when you first are going to Board Game Geek, which is a community supporting board games, there's this stuff called Geek Gold, which is currency you get for doing things. And at the beginning, Geek Gold helps you buy an avatar. And it's really important at the beginning. But pretty quickly, after you get your customization done, it, it just kind of piles up. And it's not very interesting, but by that time, you stumbled across other things. And you stumbled across more useful things, and then you've stumbled across community. And that's where this long-term engagement happens, is through community. So this is what I'm working on right now. How do you develop a gamification system from the beginning so that the gamification system will no longer be needed as you've dropped people off in the community. And so someone, if you're trying to be a gamification consultant, you probably don't want to design that. Hey, I'm going to make a system that's designed to, you know, really not be very valuable after the player's involved with it. But the idea is to create that space to help build loyalty, to help build that level of engagement, and to help get people engaged in the community. So that's where I am right now. This is, this is the journey I've taken since I was here two years ago to where I am right now is trying to develop that out. So if you want to keep up with what I'm up to or learn more, because Play Matters is the website at becauseplaymatters.com. There's a link that says publications. There's about five papers there right now, which take you through everything I've talked about here, except for this last stuff. That's what I'm writing right now. And so that takes us to the end of the hour and the end of the time I've had with you, so you can enjoy the rest of your M&Ms. Hopefully it won't spoil your lunch too much. So thank you. And I have some time for questions or... Reflections, yes. Um, I have a question and a comment. So first, did you, I loved your, your experiment, it was wonderful. And I feel like it was actually a really valuable learning journey for many of the students, even though painful at times. Um, so did you get IRB approval before you did that? No, <laughs> and I should have. <laughs> I, had to, I had to actually go yeah. on bended knee to IRB yeah, and I say, you know, I, I actually hadn't designed that as, it wasn't designed as a research, I had been thinking research at the beginning, I just thought, let's try stuff. Yeah. So. No, and I should have. But but my comment too is I think it might have, it is a very powerful pedagogy, and so you know are you are you open to doing it again with perhaps tweaking it a bit, so maybe not letting it go so long, or perhaps getting students from that year to give a video testimony at the beginning, saying this is going to be unlike any other journey <laughs> you're going to go on. Stick to the trust <coughs> us, we did, and there were moments when we thought this and that, or so, because it is so different than the other systems they played with yeah. of school. <laughs> well, and what I do now, and I'll continue to do this, is where they come into that class and they don't have a syllabus. Yeah. So I do some of it, and so what I do is, they don't have a syllabus, we immediately start the, the BLAP readings. Yeah. We start the gamification by design readings, the reward-based gamification readings. And over those first three weeks, they may, they're put into groups to make a syllabus. The syllabi then always reflect, they're all full of achievements and they're all full of badges and all these rewards. Then I put those in place, and this is like, like what happened this time. I put those in place, and then we start using it. So they actually, the students made a leaderboard for themselves. They wanted a leaderboard type setting based on the number of achievements they've earned. Mm -hmm. So I began doing that, and then they began to see the effects of it. So during this time, so we, we, we stayed with it for a couple weeks, and then I, I started them on, okay, here's your next stage, you're gonna redevelop the syllabus. But now we've started to read more of the meaningful stuff, and so then they redeveloped and uh, kind of went out. They actually, this last time I ran it, this semester, what happened was the, the students created a narrative, a time travel narrative, so this was cool. Um, the idea was that a time travel version of you has come back in time to tell you that you suck. <laughs> and has said, listen you, you suck, and if you want to end up being like me and being successful in the future, and here's what I am. So I said, the students, uh, the students came up with this whole idea. So the students said, okay, tell us who you are in the future. Dream big. You know, I'm doing this really big thing in the future, but future you says, I have to go back in time and tell past me that I suck, and here's the stuff I need to do to become future me. Mm -hmm. So each student made a set of achievements for themselves mm -hmm. based on the things they needed to accomplish by the end of the semester, the narrative was the achievements were actually designed by future them to help past them become the person that they wanted to become. So it was this really bizarre, and the students could flip into future them mode in the discussion forums. So they, would, so they could actually, they had two characters to then play. And so it was, it was, it was in, there's actually a quest in World of Warcraft that does just that, um, where you see future you who's a jerk, 
and then future you comes back in time and rescues you and then later on you have to go rescue your past you and your past you is a wimp. <laughs> um, but so that was what this so that's what they made this time. And that should be an app. The <laughs> future you yeah. says, why are you not exercising? You are a failure. <laughs> But there's a lot to that, actually. You know, yeah. I, I really thought that was a cool idea. I wouldn't, I didn't come up with that, but I like that idea of, of it because it's visualization. It's helping the students visualize who you're going to be in the future, to think about, you know, this is what I'm going to look like. This is what I want to be, and then for me to be that person, what do I have to do, and what are those steps I can accomplish? So, who knows what the? I, so that's the structure I'm using now, where I give them that freedom. The risk is if the class said, we all want A's. Okay. I mean, you have to be willing as the instructor to be able to give up that. To say, like this one, one, this class actually made me grade all of their discussions and give them points for discussion boards. I usually hate doing that. But I said, all right, well, you all have voted on this. You want this to happen. I will do it. I don't like it. And I told them later, I don't like doing this, but it's what you all wanted. So you have to be willing to do what, something you may not agree with if it's what your class votes to do. Do you also maybe also need to set limits so they set realistic goals? Because that I can see a problem with that narrative if students sets a goal that's too ambitious for themselves, and then it will become a cycle of, but I can't. So in things like that, I I help negotiate those. Yeah. So I, I try to make sure that they look fair across different students. That's really the big thing I need to do because usually students over promise for themselves. Yeah. That's what I see is you tend to have people every once in a while you got to nudge a little bit, but. It's usually, you usually get the overpromises. So that's really your role as the instructor. I have a relaying a question from chat. From oh, okay. From chat actually. So um, re regarding lab, lab design, uh, is that still manipulative if a user is knowingly choosing to engage with it? Uh, so, you know, if someone is addicted to Candy Crush or something, um, are they just knowingly and going into a system that they that, that, that they signed up for or, or, or are they still... So that's where that I talked about there's that spectrum there's that it's called organismic integration theory mm -hmm. it's written by DC and Ryan the same people that did self-determination theory and that theory actually put things like that on a scale mm -hmm. to say I accept that I am doing this it's like you know the the worst kind of extrinsic motivation is just this flat-out cash reward but then you have things like statuses, you have things like acceptance, and so that actually comes into play. So it ends up, that, that's in that gray ground. Mm -hmm. And so you, it doesn't really necessarily, it depends on the person where that's going to fit. But that's, that's the theory that helps inform us thinking about that sort of thing, is, is really just that theory. Is, because it's all about, as an organism, how do you take this motivation and place it within your own structure? Mm -hmm. If in your head you put it in the pile of extrinsic reward, then it's going to have the damaging effect. Mm. If in your head you're putting it in the pile of, hey, this is actually something I'm driven by, this is I want to do, then it won't have as bad an effect if it's taken away. So that's, that's what the, the theories would suggest. So we'll go back and then come. Can you, um, so the, the class that did the lab rats and stuff, right, that was the online class. Yeah, yeah. So that's like way more collaboration and coordination than I normally expect to see from a, a virtual community, especially on a timeline like, you know, class. Can you talk a little bit about, like, were, were a lot of these people co-located, or? No. no, so these were asynchronous. Yeah, so I've actually, at, at, at SU, we teach, all of our online classes are asynchronous in our school. So I've been doing asynchronous education for about 12 years, online stuff, and this is always the challenge. How do you get students who are in asynchronous spaces who are not co-located to actually engage with each other. One way is um, through creating opportunities earlier in the class for them to share of themselves. So you want to give people the ability to be themselves, to share of themselves. It's going to make them more likely to engage. The second thing is stressful situations. That's what happened in this case, is they had a stressful situation. They had just had this vote. They now have a limited amount of time to pull something off. And when you have that sort of that's, you know, stress creates that, it's like, well, we got to work together. Um, what I, other things I've done in classes is I've had students choose a group based upon what time during the week they'd be free. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I set up with them a phone meeting for a synchronous chat to kick it off so that I had a chat time to chat with all the group. And then they had a pattern. Because if they can have a synchronous meeting time, that does help build that up. Yeah, but our program advertises itself as being asynchronous. And so we have to we have to work around that. So those are some of the strategies. Um, 
the, the stressful situation works well. The priming the pump um, can work really well, trying to get people to engage a little bit. And then also having a time where you're with that group early on in the group formation process um, helps get things rolling a little bit better. Um, it seemed like the, the one thing that everybody agreed with, with you on was the thing about you shouldn't get an achievement for finishing the tutorial. Yeah. Uh, so I have to be the contrarian here. Uh, so I, I did this study on uh, uh, community reception of uh, the Xbox 360 mm -hmm. achievement system, and I found a lot of that complaint, say, but it was mostly the, about the wording that that shouldn't be called an achievement. It's no achievement to finish the tutorial. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do that. But I also found a lot of people who in different ways made use of that type of achievement in terms of, for instance, looking at where someone else that you, you're friends with on Xbox Live, where they are in the game. So you can ask them if you got stuck somewhere, see that they've gone past that point. Mm -hmm. Or uh, people saying that they just like to have that record of how far they've gotten in different games. So I think some of the achievements are just sort of milestones showing how far, uh, and it's you didn't achieve anything by getting there, but uh, it's just a word that's wrong and it's still meaningful in some sense, or they create meaning around them. So I wonder if that translates to, I, I'm not sure about the term meaningful versus meaningless. It seems like some of these things that you're saying are, or don't have meaning, can have meaning, meaning to, to the to individuals. This. Yeah, if you create some kind of meaning. And achievements it. actually, so I, the way I, I like to use the word achievements and trying to encourage others to use it, is when, and the difference between achievements and badges. So Xbox, the Xbox 360 system doesn't separate those two. No. For them, the, the achievements and badges are, are the same. Um, achievements, and the reason why I like to pull them out separately, is because they're actually the one spot where you can create something that is outside of the point-based structure in a system. That's actually an opportunity to do really interesting, meaningful space-type explorations, which go outside of what you normally do to progress in a game. And I think that having that, that's actually, to me, the most interesting of that whole Blap space. Our interesting achievements can help people explore a game space, explore things with each other in really cool and neat ways. And if you give the players the ability to create achievements about things they've done that they're proud of. Um, so I'm trying to get people to use that concept of achievement for things that are outside of your traditional game structure. But you could still receive a badge for where you are in the traditional game structure. So a, a badges are one are public display. So badges are public display of the achievements, but they can also be public display of your leaderboard position, points, progress in a game. So that's why I think it's important to separate those two, to say you could certainly have badges that demonstrate your progress in a game, but to focus on achievements, because in Xbox the way it works is the designer has so many points worth of achievements they can give out. So if they're giving out achievements for things like, I finished the tutorial, they've lost an opportunity to give out an achievement for something like, hey, here's a really clever way of actually exploring this game space. Try it out and play around with it. Because achievements, in my mind, of the whole BLAP system, achievements have the most potential to be playful. They're optional. They can reward this creativity. There's, they, there's a lot of potential in that achievement space that some people get, and some, some Xbox games are really clever in the sort of achievement structure to get you to explore totally different ways of playing the game. Uh, and it doesn't, and it doesn't get you points, and it doesn't get you progress. But it's it's playful. So for me, that's actually that's the diamond in the rough. I think of Blap is that is the achievement space, and, and specifically looking at them as they're things that are outside of your normal game structure. Um, there's a lot of value to that. I feel like there's a there's a value judgment between different types of having fun with games, like uh, what what T. L. Taylor calls like the instrumental play or pro productive play where you're really trying to get to a certain level or a certain point score or something like that. She has shown can be very meaningful to players. Like It can be the most retellable story from years of playing an MMO, mm -hmm. which is the, the bad kind of points laughing. The, do, can you, can you see a, a, a problem with making that value judgment in 
But it has to be a certain way to be valuable to you? I would say it's not value, the, the value would come in the connection that you allow someone to make. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I didn't have time to go into it here, but how do you, how do you make that layer of candy on the chocolate actually make more sense? Mm -hmm. How do you make it such that, I talk about using like badges uh, as mile posts instead of goal posts, and the idea that you can design game systems, you can design point systems, that as you're, you're achieving the points, because you are learning more about this real world space. And so that's that information concept. So what, I would in, what my encouragement is to think about, even if you're going to use the BLAP system, to think about how do you use BLAP to help people find meaning? How do you create those opportunities so that you don't have this point structure that's meaningless, that's not connected to, because if the goal of gamification is to motivate people to do something in the real world, right. then think about, well, how do you provide information? How do you provide relevance to raise the chance so that you will hang on with that stuff? The problem is, and why I'm critical about it, is because many systems don't make that connection. That you've got this, this point system that's not designed to help people make a connection without needing the points. So, so the value separation is only in relation to serious purposes. Right. That's that's this whole this this that's that that that, that meaningful gamification. That idea of we're trying to help people find meaning in this specific uh, right. real world setting, and that's your goal is to try and motivate them to help them find those those connections. And you could do that with just a point system, if the information is there to help people understand. Well, like the Weight Watchers point system thing. You know, with that extra information. It then helps me understand, well, yeah, I, I'm still doing the point thing, but I'm understanding why. So that if you took away that whole point thing, with, right. the, with the MMORPG model, the points, and actually the, the paper that I've just completed is called Exploring the End Game of Gamification. And it looks at what happens in an MMORPG at level cap to say, what if we think about that point in a gamification system? What, is, what happens when you hit level cap in a gamification system? What's next? So my, I look at, at MMORPG, what they do, because if you've never personally played one of these role-playing games until you hit the highest level, if, how, how many of you have hit, have hit level cap on an MMORPG? Okay, so the game changes. When you hit level cap, that world shifts. And it's an interesting shift, and it's not one that, that you're prepared for. It's not one that's, that when it's all of a sudden, this thing that has been, this experience point bar that has been your entire life of making it go bigger, all of a sudden is done. Then what? And so, and that's where that, that's that, that's making those connections to say, okay, how do you how do you still find meaning in the activity? And they're doing some. I think I think that's actually some of the more interesting spaces in, in MMORPGs right now is coming up with stuff for players to engage with. Some of them just say, ah, we'll just give them something else. <laughs> uh, implement an achievement. System. Yeah. So but, please. yeah. <laughs> so that's that's kind of what I'm exploring right now is that that level cap concept, what that would mean in a gamification space. So how do you help make those transitions between the point system and something more meaningful? Yeah. An interesting example of that might be there was a period in a game called Kingdom of Loathing <laughs> where you couldn't actually finish the game. And then it was very interesting because a lot of people who were addicted at that point are not talking about myself at all, not really. <laughs> first you actually will go and explore, explore player versus player that you were unwilling to explore before. Right. You know, then you'll go and you know look at other parts of the game that you hadn't looked at before because you had this specific thing you were trying to do and you ignored the fact that there was this really interesting world to explore, except for that. And then you sort of hit a wall and you were like, okay, what now? Because it seems like there's a wall at that stage too, yeah. where you're like, okay. And then it was when you come back and there's more content, but it's, yeah. But it's interesting because especially people you know have dropped out who are why you're still playing it, that's, I think, when that tails off, which is yeah. interesting. And Portal does it by saying, hey, you're going to burn in a fire. <laughs> Unless you figure out the second layer that's going on here, and, and then you burn in a fire. And you're like, oh, something else is happening. And so how can we build gamification systems? As I talked about with play and boundaries, one of the cool things is where you make boundaries that aren't real boundaries. So how do we make systems that appear to be X, but then you get into sort of that alternate reality game structure that all of a sudden it looks like it's X, but whoosh, and you're dropped into these new, either you're now become a creator. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things to consider is when you get out of your point structure and you're now given the power to create, and now that's a way to actually help make things a little bit more meaningful. 
Well, it looks like we're at the end of everything. So um, tomorrow at 2 o'clock in, where is it? Uh, 26153. So in 26153. Is it a 2? Is it 2? Yes. Usually it's 4. It's it's early. We made it early. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm doing, I, I, I also design board games, and I've created a game called Going, Going, Gone, which is an, a, a, an auction game where you play, you have five auctions that go off simultaneously in 10 seconds. And so I'm going to be talking about how that developed to the point it was, how that got simpler to the point it was, because it started as a really big game, and it got simple, 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 until it's now it's a very simple game. And we'll be demoing the game. There'll be a chance to play it uh, tomorrow at 2. All right, thank you all. Bye-bye.